these so-called priests who are doing this. They're not priests at this point, they're pedophiles. They're pedophiles. For those who have ears to hear, get out now. Get out now. The most powerful SSPX authority in the U.S. today has covered up sex abuse. After church militant spotlight in April last year, revealing decades of sex abuse and cover-up in the Society of St. Pius X at the highest levels, the SSPX was shaken to its core. The group, through spokesman James Vogel, issuing multiple statements promising transparency and reform. It turns out it was all talk. Now, victims are coming forward for the first time, revealing their ordeal with one notorious SSPX abuser and the way leadership, including the current U.S. District Superior, Father John Fullerton, failed to protect victims, instead protecting the abuser and the society. The systematic cover-up by senior church officials in Pennsylvania. In August 2018, Pennsylvania Attorney General Josh Shapiro released his bombshell grand jury report citing 300 predator priests allegedly molesting more than 1,000 victims. Among clergy named, Father Benedict Vanderputten, once a priest of the SSPX, accused of sexual assault. While in Los Gatos, California, Vanderputten had indecent acts with a 15-year-old girl and attempted the same with another girl, age 17. Church Militant knows the identities of the victims, but has not been given permission to make them public. Another victim, however, is coming forward. I was completely devastated. It tore me up and really messed up my faith entirely. Luann Man Warren was a naive 18-year-old when she first met Vander Putten during a retreat in Los Gatos in 1994. He offered her a teaching job, and so she returned the next year to be a teacher. Oh, I thought he was a saint. To me, he was a saint. I um, had never met someone who loved God so much. Uh, he would, you know, encouraged us to go to compliment, compliment in the evenings. He encouraged us to be there for... Um, the the benedictions and overnight adorations and I, I because of him I, I did I went to all of those things so there was no reason for you to suspect anything about him no no as a matter of fact I I, I it would have been it was the last thing that ever crossed my mind or would have ever if any in fact if anybody had ever said anything I would have been the first to say there's no way there's no way a native of Missouri Vander Putten graduated from the SSPX's St Thomas Aquinas Seminary and was ordained in 1992. Later going on to serve in Los Gatos in 1995, a small town just south of San Jose, about 20 minutes from the coast. In charge of the secluded St. Aloysius Gonzaga Retreat Center, nestled in the forested hills of Los Gatos, he led retreats for youth, including adolescent boys and girls. During retreats, Luann would stay in a cabin on the retreat center grounds and so was frequently in contact with Vanderputten. He became her spiritual director, told her she had a religious vocation, and spoke with her frequently, in person and on the phone. At one point, um, he had uh, said, I, I thought I heard him say I love you when he was hanging up the phone. And I, I thought, okay, I, mis I misheard that. So I blew it off, and then the second time he, after that he called and we were talking and he said, I love you again, and I was like, uh, bye, <laughs> hung up. I just was very uncomfortable with... How old were you at that time? I was 19 by, at that time. Over the course of months, he'd find ways to get her alone, even using the Song of Solomon, also known as the Canticle of Canticles, an Old Testament book about a bride and groom on their wedding day to sexualize their relationship. It goes, do you want me to become a saint? And I said, of course I do. And he said, do you care about my soul and my sanctity? And I said, of course I do. And he goes, so then you have a spiritual love for me. 
And so from that time, he'd always say that, and I was more accepting of it because it, it, it was, I, I had taken it the wrong way. He tried to spiritualize it. He was spiritualizing it. He would also ask inappropriate questions. He goes, so I have a, a, an awkward question to ask you, but I, I feel that you know, we're close enough as friends and, and you know, I can trust you to help me answer it without taking it the wrong way. And so I asked him, or I said, okay, so you know, what's, what is it? And he said, well, how do, how do women feel about blowjobs and giving blowjobs to their husband? And I was Did like, he use that language? He used that language. He, he asked, and I was like, well, I don't know what that is. <laughs> so he had to explain it to me, and I was like, well, I couldn't answer that. One night, the power went out in a nearby home where Luann was staying. Vanderputten offered to put her up in the schoolhouse, steps from the Priory, where she could use the cot in the bathroom. She wasn't expecting what would happen next. Well, that night I was taking a shower, and I could have sworn I locked that door into the bathroom, but I'm in the middle of taking a shower, and the next thing I know, the shower curtain comes back, and he's standing there. And I grab the shower curtain and I started to scream and he goes, Luann, it's not, it's not at all what you're thinking. It's not at all. It's not, don't, you're fine. It's fine. It's not, it's not a bad thing. It's, it's God's beauty. It's God's, you know, it's just a human body. It's, so tell me I was overreacting. Essentially, I told him if he didn't get out, I was going to scream like louder. He played it all off as a misunderstanding, left the room, and she eventually went to the office, locking herself in and falling asleep. At some point, I wake up to the light coming on, and he was standing there in his cassock. Only the cassock was open. He was fully erect right in front of my his face. Pe so his penis, his, penis. his erect penis was right in front of your face? Yeah. And I started screaming at that point, and he took off running up to the, the well, I assume up to the prairie. So he took off out of the building and ran around. I was just completely shaken up, didn't sleep the rest of the night. I was teaching the next day, but trying to figure out what I was going to do. And he ended up coming down towards the end of the school day and asking if he could talk to me. This time, the priest told the young, trusting Luann, who looked up to the priest as a holy man, she was puritanical, immature, and not ready for love. Confused, blaming herself, she continued teaching at the school until he tried to assault her again. There was one um, evening that I was they were helping out and I had, was really sick. And he told me, he's like, just go downstairs to one of the rooms that they had for the retreatants down there. And he goes, just go down there, you can just stay the night there. Um, he had given me a hot toddy to drink and I think it had a lot of alcohol in it. And I never really drink alcohol, so it, I was pretty, it, it knocked me out pretty. <laughs> um, and the next thing I know, I wake up to him in the room and again, he's in a cassock and it's undone and he's trying to get me to touch him. And, I, is he, so is, it, is he nude again? He has his erect penis again in your face. So, and so I, I just, I, I didn't know what to do. I, so at that point I just I played up the alcohol and the, the thing which I hadn't, I didn't even drink half of it, but I was just really uncomfortable and just, just acted like I, I was out of it and just closed my eyes and acted like I was asleep and really couldn't wake up. After this attempted assault, she reported him to Father Timothy Pfeiffer whom she met on retreat in Connecticut, who spoke with Vanderputten and the district superior at the time, Father Peter Scott. Vanderputten confirmed the sexual advances, but instead of disciplining him, Scott and Pfeiffer took Vanderputten's side, blaming her for being an occasion of sin for the priest. So I was essentially told that I couldn't go back to the, the retreat center, um, could no longer teach there, I could only so go back to So it was you. Things. Did anything happen to him? Nothing happened to him. No, he re he remained there. He continued um, being stationed there, running the, the priory and the okay. retreat. In touch with girls and everything. Yes. Luann eventually left Los Gatos in 1998, moving to Michigan and attending St. Joseph's Church in Armada, where SSPX priest Father John Fullerton was assigned. During that time, she found out Father Vander Putten was being allowed to lead a girls' pilgrimage to Europe. Luann was stunned, considering his past sexual misconduct, and greatly feared for her former students, especially when she found out the sleeping arrangements would separate the adult mothers from the teen girls. And I went and I found the rector of the, the parish because I 
was just shaken. Yeah. And I'm, who I'm was like, that at the time? Father John Fullerton. Father John Fullerton was U.S. District Superior late after this. After that. And now he's the current U.S. District Superior. Yes. Yeah. He, but he's, and now, yes. Um, at the time, though, he was the rector in, in, uh, in Michigan, in R Richmond, Michigan. Um, and I, I talked to him. I asked him if I could. I, I, Did you tell him everything, advice. like what happened to you? I didn't go into explicit detail. I just explained that I was involved in this situation. In where he took advantage of you. Dis situation with, uh, with VDP and that Vanderpunt and, and that um, I was concerned even then because of my students and seeing that he was doing the same kind of things with them that he had been doing with me. And he, he stopped what I was saying and he said, do you have any proof? And I said, no, I don't have any proof. He goes, you have no physical proof that he did anything to those girls. And I said, no. He goes, then you can't say anything to anyone because that would be detraction, which was also what I was told before because of it's a sin of detraction essentially to talk about a priest in a negative light. So just to get this so, straight because I've heard this so many times from so many different victims who tried to go public. So what Father John Fullerton said to you is you cannot warn these girls because it would be the mortal sin of detraction. Yes. The same excuse has been used by other SSPX clergy. As we highlighted in our April 2020 spotlight, it's the same reasoning several priests in St. Mary's, Kansas offered when whistleblower Kyle White wanted to go to police about prisoner Peter Palmieri, who had been raping his own daughter. He said not to turn uh, Palmieri in, um, and that if I was to speak about it, I would be committing a mortal sin for running his good name. Church Militant has spoken to other victims and eyewitnesses in different parts of the world who've told us precisely the same thing. When they discovered or experienced abuse, they wanted to go to authorities, but were told by SSPX clergy it would be the mortal sin of detraction. And then they went on, they two of them went on to be sexually assaulted by Father Vanderputten. Yeah. After Father Fullerton told you you couldn't warn them. I found out a year, well, later that, later that year, I think. No, the following year that they had been molested and one of them was raped and a 15 year old she was 15 at the time was raped and i was angry and upset i, I was angry at myself and i was angry and upset with them because this was the second time i had tried to warn them and it could have been prevented and it wasn't and so I was completely devastated. It tore me up and really messed up my faith entirely. All of it could have been prevented had the SSPX taken Luann's allegations seriously years before and had Father Fullerton allowed her to warn others. The life of God. After these incidents, then Superior General Bishop Bernard Fillet actually gave Fullerton a promotion, sending him to Missouri and appointing him head of the entire U.S. district. I looked at the society as the answer. I mean, and that's what, you know, that we're being, we were told, essentially, they are the only remnant of, of, of the traditional faith and essentially, you know, they're all that's left and that are holding true. And with that happening and with them protecting that and protecting him and seemingly more worried about their name than, than protecting these girls and protecting young innocent children. I just, I, it just, just destroyed me, honestly. My faith was out the window. Fullerton served in America for several years before being transferred to a post overseas, recently returning to the U.S. to once again take up the mantle of U.S. District Superior. My role is to take care of the priest, to make sure that we're using the priest properly. He arrived last fall after the previous scandal-ridden superior, priest, Father Jürgen Wegner, under criminal investigation for sex abuse cover-up, transferred to Austria. How do you feel about the fact that Father John Fullerton, the very man who told you, don't say anything because it's a mortal sin, you can't talk to these girls, then they end up getting sexually assaulted. How do you feel about the fact that he is now, once again, U.S. District Superior. Okay, that honestly, 
frustrates me and upsets me because I, not only did he tell me I couldn't talk to them, but I've since talked to and been in touch with these, a, a couple of the girls that this happened because it wasn't just those two students or others involved and but especially with with one of the girls that one of my students and she told me that he literally specifically told them not to go to the police not to report it not to and so he father was, fullerton father fullerton going back to 2001 fillet did not report vander putten's sexual assaults in california to police but sent him away to do a brief stint of prayer and penance in Scotland before his intention to reinstate him to active ministry. Church Militant Reporting has discovered this is the deceptive bishop's typical modus operandi in dealing with abusers, like Father Philippe Pagnot, a French SSPX priest who admitted to sexually abusing Vincent Lambert, the famous quadriplegic at the heart of end-of-life battles that raged in France in the mid-2000s. In fact, Lambert's condition can be laid directly at the feet of Peño, whose abuse led Lambert to a life of alcohol and drugs, leading to the fateful crash in 2008, landed him in the hospital with a broken neck. After a year of so-called prayer and penance for his crimes in Lourdes, France, Peño was, of course, reinstated to active ministry, in keeping with the pattern, where he went on to abuse multiple young boys and eventually left the SSPX. Then there's Father Pierre Duverger, the subject of a criminal probe by the Kansas Bureau of Investigation after several allegations of sexual assault of young women. Turns out, it's not the first time. In 2007, Duverger was accused of rape by the family of a vulnerable young woman receiving marriage preparation by the priest. Instead of reporting him to police, Filet sent him off to Silver Spring, New Mexico, to Our Lady of Guadalupe Monastery. Afterwards, giving him a promotion to the position of personal secretary to the U.S. District Superior. Duverger ministers freely to this day at St. Thomas More Priory near Orlando, Florida. And Father Frederick Abbe, banned by the SSPX's own canonical court from being around children after an accusation of pedophilia, whose ban was lifted by Bishop Fillet after only two months when he transferred him to live in a priory in Belgium under the same roof as a boys' dorm. Of course, he used his access to boys to sexually abuse them, some as young as age six. As Church Milton has covered in a previous spotlight, Abe was eventually convicted of child sex crimes and sentenced to five years in prison. It was only after our report aired, revealing he'd been roaming freely in Switzerland, that he was apprehended last year and extradited to Belgium to serve out his sentence. And then there's Father Christophe Juanel, sentenced to 19 years in French prison for the rape and torture of female teachers at an SSPX school. He used scissors, knitting needles, and a broom handle to torture his victims. Fillet had sent him away to a monastery in Bordeaux for, yes, prayer and penance, intending to reinstate this monster after only two years. Fortunately, law enforcement arrested him before Fillet had the chance. Similarly, Vander Putten was sent away by Fillet for his crimes, first going to Menzing in Switzerland, global headquarters of the SSPX, before Fillet made the decision to send him to a remote outpost in Scotland, the Orkney Islands, where he stayed at Golgotha Monastery. Fillet did not even inform the local monks themselves they were sheltering an abuser. From a 2018 article from STV News titled, Monks who took in priests unaware of child abuse claims, quote, We were contacted by someone associated with the Society of St. Pius X, asking us to receive a priest from America who needed to go on retreat, going on to call Vander Putten an unstable nuisance. Father Michael Mary, founder of the order, clarified, We didn't know the details of his situation. After several weeks there, he was eventually expelled from the SSPX, but not over the crime of sex abuse. Instead, he committed what Fillet viewed as the greater crime of seeking reconciliation with Rome. From Fillet's July 21st, 2001 letter to Vander Putten, the rumor was going around that you have asked Rome to relieve you from your engagement in the society. What you have already done and are doing is sufficiently serious to consider that with such an attitude, 
you expel yourself from the society. The district superior at the time, Father Peter Scott, briefly noted Van der Putten's defection from the SSPX in a 2001 letter, but nowhere mentioned his sexual crimes, instead warning the faithful about his dangerous ideas regarding reconciliation with Rome. I feel that it is my duty to warn you that in leaving the Society of St. Pius X, to which he had bound himself in perpetuity, he has taken it upon himself to attack the superior general. It is our duty to pray for him, but it is also my duty to alert you as to the dangerous ideas that he is spreading around. Vanderputten afterwards went to Scranton, Pennsylvania, joining up with other renegade SSPX priests in the Society of St. John, whose leader was homosexual predator Father Carlos Arutagoiti, ordained by the SSPX, whose sexual misconduct with boys led him to be kicked out of the diocese by Bishop James Timlin. The same bishop was also considering taking in Vanderputten, sending off papers to Rome to regularize his canonical status as a diocesan priest, only to learn of his past sex abuse allegations. When confronted, Vanderputten admitted caressing the girl's breast and exposing his genitalia, but claimed there was nothing erotic about it and instead was merely his attempt to build trust between him and the underage girl. Timlin sent him off to Southdown Institute in Ontario, Canada, a priest rehab center where he was diagnosed as having predatory behavior. The bishop finally ousted him after getting a call from a distraught mother who learned her daughter's abuser was roaming freely in his diocese. From the 2018 Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report, Bishop James Timlin, quote, received a call from a woman in January 2002 she reported Vander Putten molested her 18-year-old daughter in December 2001. What sticks in my mind is he said, you want to be a nun, and I'm an altar Christus, so it's okay for us to have sex. How old was your daughter at the time? She had just turned 18. He knew the law. That woman is Julie Suela. She's breaking her silence for the first time over her daughter's abuse. Mental suffering, I think, is worse than physical suffering. The Suelas, a family of 11 children, attended Vanderputten's chapel in Los Gatos in the 1990s and, like so many others, looked up to him and trusted him. He, in turn, ingratiated himself with the family. From what I understand, before that time, he'd spent a few years sort of grooming her. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, trying to achieve trust, um, gifts. When he would go away on trips, he would always bring back gifts for her and to the family, rosaries. As with any SSPX priest, they were taught to revere him, obey him, and never question him. After years as part of their family, Vander Putten abruptly disappeared in 2000, prisoners not told the reasons were owing to his sexual crimes. After some time passed, in June 2001, he contacted the Suela family out of the blue. He asked my daughter and myself and my husband if she would like to go out to Missouri where he lived on the family farm and she would teach his nieces and nephews at his brother's home a mile away from where he would be staying. The family thought it over and agreed, believing it would be a good experience for their daughter. Little did they know it would turn out to be a nightmare that would change their lives forever. And she flew in and he met her at the airport with a kiss on the mouth, flowers, and Therein sued uh, molestation. Staying at a home in Fair Play, Missouri, Julie's daughter slept in a room with a separate entrance from the outside. It was this door Vander Putten used to sneak into her room while she was sleeping. The assault didn't take place immediately, but only after four months of grooming, the priest, again, using the Song of Solomon to sexualize their so-called love, 
getting her alone, hugging and kissing her, preying on her youth and vulnerability, convincing her he was in love with her. The final assault involved coming into her room at night through the side door, unclothing her and trying to penetrate her. But she stopped him and refused to allow it to continue. Father John Peake, who was friends with Vanderputten. And he called me and he said, there's some sexual tension going on here. I don't know what's going on, but you need to take her back home. So we did. And did you find out right away or what, how was your daughter's demeanor when she came back? When she came back, she was very reserved. She wasn't happy and her health started to decline over a year and some months so that she became more like, wouldn't eat, anorexic. It was only a year and a half later that she finally opened up to her father and mother. By that time, the statute of limitations to prosecute sex crimes in Missouri had already passed. Devastated, Julie turned to SSPX leadership for help. Today is the third Sunday after Epiphany. First, the SSPX priest assigned to Los Gatos after Vander Putten had left. I went to Father Daniel Cooper, and he said, I will not testify against a brother priest. So he was, Father Daniel Cooper was unwilling to help you. Right. She then turned to the highest SSPX authority in the U.S. I went to Father Peter Scott, who was the district superior then. He said, I'll take care of it, but don't tell anyone because that's a sin, a mortal sin of detraction. So the U.S. District Superior at the time, Father Peter Scott, told you not to tell anybody else about the sex abuse that Father Benedict Vanderputten had perpetrated on your daughter, saying that it would be a mortal sin of detraction. That is correct. The SSPX initially appeared to take the attitude that Vander Putten was no longer their responsibility, washing their hands clean of him with little care as to whether this sexual predator might find other victims now that he was let loose into wider society. Some years later, Julie's family discovered Vander Putten was still acting as a priest, giving a retreat at a nearby parish, and they confronted him. My husband and my son, Peter, went down there and they stood up in front of the congregation. And my husband said, while well, Vander Putten was giving the retreat, said, I know what you did to my daughter. So he said that in front of everybody? Yes. Wow. When my husband said this, he molested my daughter sexually. People started screaming. And someone called the police. So did Father Vanderputten <clears throat> say anything in response? His response was, I'm sorry. That's like an admission. Correct. Julie spent years writing to various church officials and even to Rome, informing them of Vanderputten's whereabouts, the fact that he was still ministering as a priest and misleading others, begging them to put a stop to this predator. As we noted, it was her call to the Scranton Diocese that got the priest kicked out of Pennsylvania, and it was her letters to the Vatican that eventually got him laicized in 2005 under Pope Benedict, after more than a dozen years as an SSPX priest. SSPX global headquarters in Menzingen lauds itself for reporting Vanderputten to Rome when they learned he was still ministering as a priest, but it was too little, too late. The damage had already been done damage that could have been prevented had the SSPX acted sooner. How does it make you feel to know that this man has never faced justice? You know, he always said, there's consequences to our actions. He always preached that. And that's what I would say to him. You have not suffered the consequences of your actions. We are not revealing the identity of Julie's daughter out of respect for her privacy, but we've spoken directly with her and have confirmed all the details of her abuse. We've also spoken with other young women, grooming victims of Vander Putten, who revealed his modus operandi was always the same, singling them out for attention, showing affection, getting them alone, 
using the Song of Solomon to sexualize their love. Father Fullerton just did a little interview when he became U.S. District Superior again a few months ago. They specifically asked him about sex abuse, and he said, we take sex abuse very seriously. If he takes it so seriously, then they need to be addressing these situations and not covering them up. They're not protecting the innocent. That's, that is their responsibility as priests, as Catholics, is to protect the innocent. They're not protecting the innocent. They're protecting these priests and they're protecting themselves. I'd like to say to Father Fullerton specifically, he knew about me. He knew about these girls. He knows about these other priests. If he is truly a man of integrity, a priest of integrity, who truly believes in his faith and truly wants to protect the innocent, then he would protect the innocent and do what is right and not continue to cover up what is happening. As to Vander Putten, after he was laicized, he moved to Hawaii and married a 16-year-old girl with whom he had four children. It appears they eventually divorced and he moved to Shawnee, Oklahoma, just east of Oklahoma City, where he lives today. Not only am I doing this for my daughter and all the girls that have been molested, but I'm doing it for his daughters. Are you worried for his daughters? Very. Uh, my mother's heart. Church Militant contacted Father Fullerton and Father Scott for comment, asking, among other things, if they believe they bear some responsibility for Vander Putten's crimes. In spite of promises from spokesman James Vogel that they'd respond within two weeks, we received no answers from the priests, even though we gave them more than two weeks. Church Militant also contacted Benedict Vander Putten, asking him to address the allegations. He also failed to respond. As to Julie, she has strong opinions about the SSPX's blame in the matter. Absolutely, they bear responsibility, and they shirked it. They acted like it was the girl's fault. That attitude carried over to the SSPX community Julie had been a part of for 12 years, her friends abandoning her after she reported her daughter's abuse, another common theme Church Militant had discovered in multiple cases. To me, they, they quit talking to me. They would look at me and make a face. They ignored me. It was terrible. I went through uh, mental <laughs> agony over that, on top of the mental anguish of what happened to my daughter. As to Julie's daughter, the effects of the betrayal linger to this day. She stopped practicing the faith, nor does she trust clergy. Oh, she does not trust a priest ever, will never, and I don't blame her. She can't, all the way from mental anguish, why didn't I do this, why? Why did this develop this way? Uh, all the questions, and I suppose self-blame. And Julie's reaction to Father Fullerton back at the helm in the US. I feel that he washed his hands of my case long ago, and it's coming back to haunt him. He's gonna have to face the music. He's not gonna like it one bit. To this day, Vander Putten's name remains on the Scranton Diocesan website of credibly accused priests, as well as that of the Diocese of San Jose, California. But nowhere is he listed on the SSPX website, which is scrubbed clean of his name, with no mention of him anywhere, as if he had never existed. We've got to try to stop this. We've got to protect these, because all of these kids, these young children, <laughs> Are having their lives destroyed, their, their faith destroyed because of what's happening and it's being protected and it's allowed to continue. It's a study in contrasts, 
the so-called Vatican II Church, showing greater accountability for abuser clergy, while the SSPX remains silent, striking out his name in the hopes the public never finds out they once formed and harbored a predator, one of many. Meanwhile, Vander Putten roams freely in Oklahoma, never having faced justice for his crimes. And one of his protectors, Father Fullerton, who silenced whistleblowers and victims, is now back at his post as the most powerful SSPX authority in the U.S., in charge of the many souls here who continue to blindly trust and look up to him and other clergy they believe are beyond reproach. In spite of all the talk about transparency and reform, it's clear it's back to business as usual for the SSPX. Christine Niles, Church Militant, Detroit.